Good afternoon. Turn once again to the book of Malachi, Messenger of the Law, the prophet, book of Malachi, and we're in chapter 3. If you would turn to Malachi chapter 3, and we are only going to read, uh, we're going to read the first 12 verses of Malachi chapter 3. I beg your pardon, we're going to read from verse 6, from verse 6 through 12. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say... How shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Thereby thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, Pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. Your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, your word tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have heard your word today, we have heard it preached, we have heard it read, and we come now to hear it preached once again. So our prayer is, Lord, increase our faith, we pray. And if we have no faith, would you give us that faith as a free gift to trust in Christ and him alone for our salvation? Bless us, Lord, as we contemplate your word for Christ's sake and his glory. Amen. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 is our text for today, the first verse that I read. If you wanted a title, you want to write at the top, it's the immutability of God. The immutability of God. Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And in our text today, verse 6, Malachi 3, this actually forms a link for us between the first five verses that we looked at in the previous two sermons and this next section, which we'll start uh, next week, verses 7 to 12. In fact, verse 6 is the reason for verses 2 to 5. The work of the messenger of the new covenant that he will usher in. We looked at this last week. That everlasting covenant of grace, it will bring a change so desperately needed, starting with a new part promised in the new covenant, as we observed last Lord's Day. It will revive a refining and a purifying process for God's people, and that was part of the work of the message of the covenant. It would involve an exposure of the sins of the people, uh, as we observed in the ministry of Jesus. And finally, it would involve a judgment, and in the second coming, the final coming of the messenger of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very God and very man, Emmanuel, God with us. And this is the reason God has not Changed, And we'll explain this shortly. Furthermore, this text links us to the new section that we read, even that, uh, those passage, that passage this morning. Uh, it will give us, it will give the people a way to prove for themselves that this is not so, that God is unchanging. The action God has in mind by the prophet will so touch their pockets that their repentance will be costly and therefore genuine. The response of the Lord to this repentance will also be measurable in material terms when the next, next few harvests are reaped. 
and the man who puts his possessions at God's disposal will find tangible evidence to prove that he accepts and blesses the giver. And we'll see in coming weeks that the Lord tries them. He says, test me in this, and this will be the proof. And so verses 7 to 12 uh, of our reading, which we'll look at in the next few weeks, uh, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil. Your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Proof there will come that I, the Lord, do not change. We have seen It had been reported by the prophet Malachi that the people were guilty of many and serious sins. The priests, you remember, were offering blemish to sacrifice as animals in a formal but insincere religious duty. Many were divorcing the wives and marrying unbelieving women. Many were disobeying God's law by withholding tithes of their harvests. They were all accusing God of loving them half-heartedly and of being unjust in their dealings with him because he has not prospered them adequately. We looked at these things, and the answer is from God, of course, that God has not changed. It is the people who have changed, who down through their history had fallen away from a true love for God and from the truly righteous life that their forefathers had. Remember last week, Malachi 3 and verse 4, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. They had changed. They had departed from those ways. And yet, in another sense, the problem is that the people, we must include ourselves at this point, had changed so little. Though fallen from the original early devotion to God, they were nevertheless exactly as they had been for much of their history. And you know this, the history of the people of Israel uh, from the release and the captivity in Egypt. Exceedingly sinful and self-righteous, and they needed his people. As Malachi comes again in this passage, in this book, to tell them to repent. So let's come now to our text, Malachi 3 and verse 6, and observe in the first place, and we only have two points this afternoon, in the first place that, number one, God does not change. 3 and verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. He is the Lord Jehovah. I am that I am, he changes not. And if we're in the book of 1 John, we should say, we know this. God does not change. Deuteronomy 33 and 27, the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he thrusts out the enemy before you and said, destroy. Psalm 102, they will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. The offspring shall be established before you. It is because God does not change that he cannot be satisfied with less than perfect Holiness, As Leviticus reminds us, for I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy. And it's for this reason that we observe that the Lord last week will be a swift witness against all transgressors of his law. And yet the wonderful truth is that this unalterable holiness of God does not cancel or even interfere with his unchanging grace and mercy. Isn't that a wonderful truth? 
that the unalterable holiness and justice of God that must punish and will punish sin and justice must be satisfied does not interfere at all or cancel his unchanging grace and mercy. This grace is a free grace, unmerited love and mercy based solely on the all-sufficient merits of his appointed messenger that we've been looking at. And it's because of his unchanging grace that the sons of Jacob are not consumed. And it's because of his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ that is for sinners, even the greatest of sinners. Romans 5.21 puts it so clearly, Now the law came to increase trespass. The law before us, our inability to keep it, came to increase trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as you all know, this theology, theology of this doctrine is called immutability. It means that being perfect, God cannot and does not change. For a moral being to change, he must change either for the better or for the worse. If you say someone's really changed, what you mean is he's changed for the better or he's changed for the worse. God cannot get better because that means that he was less than perfect. But God cannot get worse either because in that case he would become imperfect, which he cannot be. God is and must remain perfect in all his attributes. Listen to chapter 2 of our confession. The Lord our God is but one living and true God whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit invisible without body parts or passions who only hath immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable, unchanging, and the most righteous will for his own glory, most glorious, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. Wonderful resource, our confession of faith. But we must ask at this point, what are the specific areas in which God does not change? And why does God mention this particular divine doctrine here? God does not change in any of his attributes. Attributes like sovereignty, wisdom, holiness, self-existence, self-sufficiency, knowledge and justice. But the relevant attributes here in this text are his mercy, his love, his grace, and his faithfulness. Malachi 3 says it's because of God's immutability in these areas that the people have not been consumed. Because of his mercy and his grace and his faithfulness to his covenant, that is why they have not been consumed. So once again we see that it's surprising That the people's complaint, you remember, in the former verses, where is the God of justice? In this context, we would expect God to say, I have not changed in my demand for justice, and I will judge the ungodly. Instead, we find that the emphasis is on his grace and mercy. As we saw in the previous verse, that God was coming not to judge but to save his people. The messenger was to prepare a way for Jesus, who was to redeem and to purify them, as we saw last week. So we find the same thing here. 
God emphasizes immutability to say that he is unchanging in his faithfulness, which is why the people have not been destroyed for their transgression. How gracious is God. The people were accusing him of changing, of becoming unfaithful. And God simply replies that he is unchanging, precisely in faithfulness, which is why these very people had not been cut off. Why the Lord do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Brothers and sisters, because God is immutable, therefore no word that he has spoken will fall to the ground. Not a single word. For God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. He has said and he will do it, or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? God is a just revenger of those who rebel against him. Uh, Is he the bountiful reward of those who diligently seek him? In both of these, he is unchangeable. Though the sentence passed against evil works will not be executed speedily, yet it will be executed. And God, he is the Lord, he changes not. He is as much an enemy to sin as he ever was. And impenitent sinners will find him so. God's judgment is never antiquated or out of date. But against those who go on still in their trespass, uh, the, course of the, the curse of the law still remains in full power and virtue for them. What a blessed fact that because of the messenger of his covenant and the new everlasting covenant established in his own blood, the immutability of God's mercy grace and faithfulness which also has never changed for God is a covenant keeping God but because of the son the benefits of these have been applied to his children by the giving of new hearts God who does not change who cannot lie has fulfilled his prophecy has come to dwell with us and he is our God God cannot change this brings us to our second point our second point and only two points we'll have three sub points under this number two god cannot change number two man changes and yet cannot change but must change man changes and yet cannot change but the man must change So there are three sub-points and our second point, which appears to be conflicting. So let's go through them. First of all, we have, or A, if you like, man is mutable. Man is mutable. In fact, the the verse we read and we'll look at next week, verse 7 says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. There was a time when you did. And you changed, and you changed. We joke and say that it's a woman's prerogative to change her mind. We change all the time. We change all the time. Set against the immutability of God, in contrast, here is man who since the fall is everything God is not. God is unchanging. Man is a shifting shadow. God is eternal. Man is a vapor. God is holy and righteous in all his ways. Man is deceitful, desperately sick in all his ways. God is faithful. Man is unfaithful. God cannot lie, but every inclination of man's heart is bent towards deceit, lies, and sinfulness. Listen in contrast to the immutability of God, what our our confession says about man in just uh, chapter 6 and paragraph 1. Although God created man upright and perfect, gave him a righteous law, which had been unto life had he kept it, and threatened death upon the breach thereof, yet he did not long abide in his honor. Satan using the subtlety of the serpent to subdue Eve, then by her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion did willfully transgress the law of their creator, 
and the command given to them and eating the forbidden fruit which God was pleased according to his wise and holy counsel to permit, having proposed to order it for his own glory. Once again, our confession here in the book of Malachi is a clear illustration how the people of God were forever changing, as is also evident down through their history. Because there is no constancy in man, he is forever changing. His faithfulness to God is waning, like the children of Israel, then trusting, then not believing, then worshipping, and then grumbling against him. His glory fading, his word unsure, the wickedness of his heart in his fallen state going from bad to worse. His worship of God shifting from God to idols and God to idols down through their history. His obedience to God's word fickle. In a word, man in his fallen state had no health in him whatsoever. Here in the days of Malachi, having returned to, uh, from their captivity from Babylon, uh, which had cured them for a while of their idolatry, temple worship was restored, and not long we find the people changing again, grossly neglecting God in worship, in hypocrisy, their sacrifices, robbing God in tithes and offerings, marrying foreign wives, and now they despise his name. They pollute his table, and God will not accept the sacrifices of those whose hearts are far from him, full of self-righteousness and selfishness. What is your life, says the Apostle James, for you are mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Psalm 102, my days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. Psalm 105, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Man is mutable, changing. And yet our second sub-point B, yet man cannot change. Yet man cannot change. While we have noted that man is a changing creature with no constancy, uh, and in every way since the fall, the inclination of man's heart is toward evil all the time. Yet most of the time, the change is for the worse. So much so that man, in his persistent rebellion against stern, stern in his state towards God, God has just given him over. We read in Romans chapter 1 today, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worship to serve the creature rather than the creator. And yet we've seen through the Old Testament, as we illustrated again in Malachi, man is incapable of change. Most importantly, man in his natural state before God cannot change his status Toward God. The one area that man needs to change effectively, his relationship with God, he is unable to affect. He cannot change. Like a leopard who cannot change his spot, so is all mankind in their sin. They, not just the Malachites, were in a state and are in a state of rebellion against God. The heart of the matter is the matter of of the heart as we know so well, which is exactly what the messenger of the new covenant addresses. The heart transplant, the removal of that stony heart and the transplanting of a heart of flesh by the Spirit of God. My friends, outside of this new covenant, outside of this heart surgery, this heart transplant, there is nothing that you and I can do to change our ways or to make us acceptable before a holy, unchanging God. 
You could devote your life to doing good things. You can attend every worship service every Sunday. Don't stop doing that because that's where faith comes. But you can do that for the rest of your life. You can ask forgiveness from every person that you've ever sinned against. No amount of self-effort outside of Christ will make the slightest difference when you stand before God one day. You can be the best person in the world. And I've met them. Just wonderful people. But outside of Christ. And Pastor Sam pointed out, even they are of their father, the devil. Why? Because they cannot change their hearts. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none that seek after God. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, and the wages of sin is death. And as with the Israelites of old, no amount of reform will last. The prophet's thunderings, the Lord's chastisements, and the judgments cause his people to turn for a while. And then the pattern of sin and of rebellion, of self-righteousness and dissatisfaction returns. The holy law of God condemns us And not even the blood of a thousand bulls or goats can cure us of our sin and free us from the slavery to sin. Friends, do not think for a moment that you can work this out with God one day because you're a nice person. You cannot change your sin nature and your slavery to sin. Without Christ, without the new covenant in the blood of Christ, We stand condemned before a holy, righteous, just, and unchanging God. Man is unable to change in his standing before God. This brings us to our third and final point. I'll try and be brief today. Man must change. And yet thirdly, man must change. Man must change. We've noted that God is immutable in all his ways, And man, in contrast, is mutable in all of his ways. However, the ways in which man is capable of change is extremely limited. And man's ability to change outside of Christ is progressing in evil, going from bad to worse and simply being slaves to sin. Any meaningful and lasting reform, particularly with regard to our state before God, is way beyond our ability Outside of Christ, we can only act according to our sin nature and that common grace that remains in us. We are unable to keep all God's law. In fact, we are unable even to keep one point of his law fully. In short, we cannot please God. Neither can we. In and of ourselves, we cannot be reconciled to him. And so we left with a huge dilemma. Man is left with this dilemma, we must change. And God commands us to change. Man must change. The old covenant demanded obedience to God's holy laws as a conditioning to live, living in the land and being prosperous and enjoying God's blessing. Do this and live, the old covenant that we find in the Bible. And because of man's inability to do so, God made the provision of sacrifices, sin and guilt offerings for the sin of the people to stay his judgment. By the compliance of these laws and forms of worship in the Old Testament, God's people were sustained to be able to inherit the land and to enjoy God's temporal blessings for them. Yet it quickly becomes apparent to us that these did not change their hearts at all. And so the New Testament comes and explains this to us. These were all a shadow of the good things to come. In fact, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away our sin. So the Lord demanded in the Old Testament that which man could not do. And it simply highlighted our helplessness and our hopelessness of a sinful man before a holy God. Man must change And yet man cannot change. So with the coming of the new covenant, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, even now, 
the gospel demands change, and we still cannot change ourselves. And we are still unable to seek after God. And we find the gospel which comes to every man, woman, and child still demands what we cannot do. God commands all men everywhere to repent. To repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, my friends, is the beauty of the gospel. God gives us what he commands His covenant promises of the unchanging God are yea and amen. The new covenant is announced by John the Baptist through the preaching of repentance. And by the gift of the Holy Spirit, he gives new life. And he gives us new hearts. And we are enabled by faith, which too is a gift of God, to believe on Christ. And we are able to repent and believe on Christ and Christ alone for our salvation. So Hebrews puts this so well in chapter 10, for since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And in the same chapter and verse 15, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after these days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. What the Old Testament promised in types and shadows, but could not do, the new covenant has done for us, brought us life and that change in heart. But back to our text, as we close for a moment, which declares that God's glorious immutability Let's take note of the second phrase there. Who is it promised for? Verse 6 again. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Because of his covenant of life and peace, because of the immutable God who will always remain faithful to his word, the people in Malachi's day are not consumed. The year of the Lord's favor is coming. In his grace and mercy, he will stay judgment a little longer. Let's note an interesting point here, that they are not called the children of Moses or the children of Abraham. They're not called after these great men who believed God, who trusted in the promise. Men like Abraham who believed God was credit to him as righteousness. But the text said, O you children of of Jacob. Who are we? Who are these promises for? God, the fact that he does not change, will not consume who? The sons of Jacob, the deceiver, the thief, not the one who's remembered for his faith in God mostly, but a child of wrath, like all men, one of whom, of whom God said, though we did nothing to deserve it, Jacob have I loved. But Esau Have I hated? Did he do anything to deserve that? No. And those are the ones who are not consumed. His church, of which he says, Jacob, have I love. A reminder to us again that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's based purely on undeserved favor of God, who elected us in love, as Ephesians 1 reminds us, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. Friends, this leaves one important thing to say to you 
If you here today, having heard again the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, having heard that God commands you to do that which you cannot do, and to hear that God gives you as a free gift the very thing that he commands you to do, that which you could not do, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And the answer is, you will not escape. You will face judgment if you neglect this great salvation. Isaiah urges us in 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God who will abundantly pardon Do that which you cannot do by looking to Jesus Christ, by looking to the the messenger of the covenant who is ushered in the everlasting covenant that says, live and do this, not do this and live, but live. Here is life. Here is a free gift. Here, justice has been fully satisfied in Christ. And he gives to you a gift called faith that you can believe on him. Take it, take it and believe on him. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Man must change. God alone can make that change. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, Rejoice in your salvation. Give glory to God that he has done what you could not do. He has changed you. He has given us new hearts. He has put his spirit within us. He has caused us to walk in his ways. And he is still changing us. He's refining and purifying us by his spirit as we observed last week. Remember that we serve an unchanging God. God who is immutable and all his ways are just and his word is sure because he is unchanging. Let's thank the Lord that we are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, by the Lord do not change. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow before you in worship this afternoon when we have tried to contemplate your greatness and your immutability, the fact that you do not change. Oh, Lord, you are, your depths and the riches of your name and your character are beyond finding out, and yet you have revealed yourself to us, and you bring us great comfort in your word. When you say, I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. O Lord, how we thank you for your salvation. How we thank you that justly we should face everlasting torment, and our sins condemn us, and we have strayed from your ways, and the inclination of our hearts is always, was always bent towards sin. And yet you came, and because you do not change, you have brought the messenger of the covenant, and you have given us new hearts, and you have put life within us, and you have breathed your spirit into us. And we, and your son, your only son, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that by faith in Christ, In his work for us, we are forgiven and we are not consumed. Oh, Lord, we pray as you continue your work of purification and refining of your church, may we live to the praise and glory of your name. How we thank you that though we were unable to change, you loved us and you have had an everlasting love which you have set upon us, and you keep us in your love. Oh, Lord, for those here who have never called upon your name, 
who have never put their faith in Christ and Christ alone, we pray that today their hearts may not be hardened and that they would call upon you, that they would trust in Christ and Christ alone. Lord, we worship you for your wonderful gospel. We worship you for changing our hearts. We worship you for your great love. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.